Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Piece of housekeeping before we get started, for those of you who have yet to check out jasonpereira.ca, so you can sign up for my newsletter and uh, at the same time receive notifications of both this podcast and other podcasts and blog postings and television shows, please do so as soon as possible. I hope you'll find all the content informative and interesting. And now on to today's show. Today's guest is Garrett Vickers, co-founder of Limelight Health. Limelight Health is a company that's working on digitizing the entire experience of insurance application from start to finish. And with that, here's my interview with Garrett Vigors. Hello, Garrett. Hey, Jason. Thanks for taking the time. You bet. Pleasure to be on the podcast. Thanks. Good to see you again, at least remotely this time. So Garrett Vigors, co-founder of Limelight Health. Tell us about Limelight Health. Well, Limelight Health, uh, we started essentially, we have health in our name because we actually started focused on in the U.S. with small group health insurance when the Affordable Care Act all came out. So that's where we started. But now, six years later, Limelight Health is a, a carrier solution. We focus on streamlining and automating new business workflows. So RFP intakes, quoting for all group products. So we're just group focused. We streamline quoting, underwriting proposals to get to a sole proposal. And then we have a number of integrations, right? So we push integrations downstream to an enrollment systems or policy admin systems. And, and then you come up for renewal. So we're really focused on new business renewals and making that a beautiful experience for group products, group carriers working with their distribution partners. So lots to unpack there. I mean, but it basically sounds like you're trying to better the entire end-to-end -end experience for all parties involved, essentially. Yeah. And again, when we get into kind of a background, just, you know, understanding the brokers, what they need to do to serve their clients. And there's a little bit of friction from their goal and what they need to do versus what the carrier needs to do. And so it's mm -hmm. really understanding that dynamic and how can technology help both parties work together. So let's talk about the impetus for the creation of Limelight Health. I mean, besides the Affordable yep. Care Act being passed yep. and an opportunity existing there, what really drove the foundation of this company? So again, I have an interesting background as one of the four co-founders. I wanted to play music. That was my, my <laughs> vision for my life. But I have a wife and three kids and figured for sure they're more important than my, than my musical dreams and passions. So really, my, my entry into the group insurance industry was in around 2001, when HRAs, health reimbursement arrangements, mm -hmm. that, that law was passed, consumer-driven health. And it was this idea that, hey, let's give better value to employees, right? So I started working with, ended up being my mentor with two companies in consumer-driven health, Veritas Health Systems which was a, essentially a tech-driven TPA for HRAs and HSAs. So back in 01, I started understanding the issue and the value that these accounts could provide tax savings and give more value to employees. So I started getting passionate then about the group market. And then he started Innovius, which was really a bunch of tech tools to help employees say, hey, my employer's given me $1,000 in an HSA. I can put in money and I can use it for dental or chiropractic, right? So that's where I learned a lot about the group industry, learned a lot about the issues that brokers and distribution have with change, right? Because mm -hmm. new ways to sell, it means whoa, whoa, whoa. we have- <laughs> Wait, an insurance company having a problem with change? No. Insurance companies, exactly. Insurance companies and brokers, right? It was like, hey, yeah. No, God. You got to sell at 5,000 deductible again in, in US, like the medical. And, you know, half your people don't even use the 250 deductible. So maybe there's higher value to give, write a check to your people, your employees, right? And so I would see that and I got passionate. I ended up getting licensed as a broker. I had a boutique agency. So I had a bunch of employers, mainly small groups, saying, hey, we want to do an HSA plan, but our broker won't talk about it or thinks it's scary, it's change. And, and, and I was just leading with that. So that introduced me meeting with employers, getting passionate about helping employers find right decisions, helping their employees get the benefits they need with all the latest and greatest technologies and, and new carriers providing new options. So that was pre-Limelight that mm -hmm. really positioned me to understand the problems that exist in the group um, process of quoting, which was I was buried in spreadsheets. I literally had spreadsheets to get four carriers rates and present them to an employer. It was painful. So yeah. well, it's still painful in my world where that is very similar. <laughs> so basically, no doubt you turned you at some point said there's got to be a better way. <laughs> yeah. And that's what started all this. So so it, tell me about those first kind of experiences with with the insurance companies and going to them and trying to show them there's a better way. How did that go? Yeah. How those conversations, so, how did the entire experience start? So, you know, to understand how we actually started and when I talk about the Affordable Care Act. So again, my background with HRAs, HSAs, helping Veritas and Inovius, and then the Affordable Care Act came, he was starting a third business. And there was this whole thought that if you remember the Affordable Care Act, are groups going to cancel in the U.S., cancel yeah. coverage because in government's writing a check. 
So that was this real like, oh my gosh, there's new laws and it's very expensive in the US for insurance, right? And what's going to happen to the small group market, mainly the like micro group size. So I made a native iPhone app and Android before Limelight. And that's where Alan, our CTO and I, another co-founder of Limelight, we made that app and we wanted to help provide valuable information so that people could make good decisions with the new law. Well, that, that led us ultimately to Jason Andrew, our CEO, and Michael Lujan, who was, Michael Lujan was at Covered California, the largest exchange, state-based exchange in, in the country and in California, mm-hmm. Covered California. So I showed him my app and he thought, wow, that's great, but I work, you know, Covered California. Well, he left and he was talking to Jason and talking to me. We all came together, long story short, we realized the value of the group market was not going to dissolve. Right. So I actually had in my little boutique agency, a few groups that said, oh, my gosh, we can save all this money and do individual plans. Well, like nine months later, they called me up, said, hey, can we get back on a a bad idea? (laughs) Oh, yeah. They said, and I'm like, you wanted to save money and I'm living on the edge. Right. And I said, let me run some options. Right. And the group options were like 40 percent more expensive. And they said, that's a great deal. And I said, wow, I've never heard that before. You want to spend 40 percent more. But the value of that group sponsored product was was seen right and and just in, in the US with the whole way it went down and this the difficulties of individual insurance and you know there's still issues today but anyways that was what why we pivoted and launched limelight february 2014 group focused like we're not going to go down the individual path we're going to stay group focused and we retooled our product to be a native ipad and it was this vision just quoting medical multiple carriers for a broker we started working with brokers, I was the first customer, if you will. And how can I sit with an employer and slide dials around to make good decisions on contributions and benefits and your key employees are paying this, now they pay that. So it was a native iPad. And we thought it was the coolest thing ever. We can like be on iPads and use technology. And it was great for me, but not great for every broker we wanted to sell to who wasn't used to an iPad. I mean, their kids were using their iPads back then. Oh, good God. Yeah, apparently their fingers didn't work properly. No, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, I, I mean, I'd still kill for that functionality in this country where I don't have it. Yeah, it, it's so it's interesting. I mean, you it's such a uniquely American perspective because, again, the lack of true uh, universal health care and the entire introduction of, of some form of that and the panic amongst the general market that was making a living off of before, I can totally see how that would be the case, right? It's a disruptive change. However, good on you for not, for steering into the disruption. And, and like so many companies I've spoken to, you're, you're a homebrew. Like you solved your own problem and lo and behold the market values that product and therefore that was the impetus of it given where you are today and kind of it's kind of interesting to hear you start off with an iPhone with, with a simple iPhone app <laughs> yeah yeah it's quite I the mean, journey it, isn't it oh well yeah I mean if you look at you know iPhone to iPad and then when we started really looking at brokers and then I'll get into kind of where we sit today with selling carriers a solution it's not even medical yeah. carriers mainly it's it's all the non-medical it's dental vision life disability accident critical hospital gap medical which you know which is big focus in USA and Canada with that product mm-hmm. portfolio and there's a there's there's a massive standardization that has to eventually come for that market and those products to be easily quoted underwritten renewed but we started with medical so we went from phone pad, iPad to full desktop because the feedback was, hey, does it work on Internet Explorer 6? And we're thinking, oh. Oh, how about Chrome? Can you just use Google Chrome? And that was a big push, you know, like leading a lot of the Ben Admin enrollment platforms that were similarly arising with us. But my was, Windows 7 device doesn't, doesn't seem to have access exactly, to it. Yeah. Exactly. So my Chrome ex, my was XP a big computers lead. having, uh, let's move on. <laughs> so what, what I would say, you know, again, to fast forward from broker solution problem, we ended up realizing there's a massive problem with the carriers internally to get those rates and that quote to the broker. And that is and, putting it lightly, but continue. <laughs> so it was a bit, I'd say, heretical to think and imagine the progressive world of auto insurance where every carrier is going to just spreadsheet their rates and plans. They're not because no. there's no standardization. So what we realized, and we sold probably four years ago, our first carrier underwriting solution to streamline so that broker can actually send an email to a carrier and the carrier can sales, put it in Salesforce and there's an integration in the limelight and go through that whole process of rating, mm-hmm. underwriting, get a proposal out the door. And that problem is massive internally. We realize that we have to solve the carrier's problem so they can actually best serve their brokers, right? Because mm-hmm. what was happening is that we're trying to like get the brokers to do the work, which is not necessarily bad, but there has to be technology really leveraged on both sides internally and externally with distribution partners for the maximum collaboration and efficiency and value to get to the employer and the employee. So that was really 
the latest shift over the last year is selling just direct to the carriers and allowing them to be future ready with where the market's going, technology, AI, machine learning, NLP. There's so much technology that's about to become the norm in yeah. the next few years. So we really want to solve the problem from the inside out versus a lot of brokers. A lot are, are there's a lot of disruption. There's a lot of aggregation of brokers and retiring, right? So there's a lot of change happening there and they don't want technology. They don't, they're not going to adopt it. Is there's a lot of change happening. Uh, yeah. And, you know, then they, they wonder why they're not getting the valuations they're going to get. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you're right. I mean, the insurance industry, you know, the number of people complain about things on the investment side of the world when it comes to technology. And I say, well, if you run a real shock, <laughs> go find an yeah. insurance industry where, you know, the, some of these computers are probably still using vacuum tubes for the better, for, for all we know. And it's, but it's something that's basically endemic of every level of the insurance industry, as you found out, which is not just, not just the insurance industry itself. It hasn't been driven by the sales force. Like, the, I'm sure younger advisors now are just like, why can't I do this? But for years, everybody just accepted it was the way it was, right? And there wasn't yeah. this underlying initial like grassroots drive to say, hey, if you don't make this easy, I'm going to start putting my business elsewhere, right? So yeah. it was always just price-based, commoditized. Yeah, I'd say like another big part, and it kind of tees into the, the beginning and the elevator pitch. Another big reality and vision for us is that we're not trying to do everything. We're right. not a policy <laughs> admin system. We're not a CRM. We're not an enrollment platform. So from a pure vision perspective, there has to be an ecosystem. There has to be an ecosystem mm -hmm. in the group market and you have to be able to integrate and systems need to talk to each other because the whole idea that you can find one vendor to do everything from literally pre-quote, pre-sale, all the way to claim and renewal. We haven't seen that to be the case. And for us to go deep in new business underwriting and renewal workflows, that's where we are then we have to have an ecosystem. So and, are you still encountering that that mentality? The I'm looking for the one magic bullet solution. It seems like, you know, many industries have moved well beyond that and accepted modularization and, and interoperability of ecosystems and, and the ability to, you know, basically connect everything through APIs. But are you still seeing that in the insurance world that everybody's kind of looking for the, no, no, what's the next version of this, of this server that's going to serve my purposes? Yeah. What I would say right now, it's kind of like if you look at financial banking and PNC. So yeah. there was this idea that before, with property and casualty, you best in breed. And now they've got a good 10 years on the group market. I, cause I focus on the group market. And so you've got folks like Guidewire and Duck Creek that have built out everything. So you can get almost everything there, but the group yeah. market's not there. But vendors that are in the PNC that are in the group are wanting to tell that story now as if it's real, but it's, 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 it's not three real. to five years off. So what we're seeing in the market is there's a look for it in the group market. There's a lot in the US and Canada, big digital transformation stuff happening in 2020. That's happened last year, 2020. And they're trying to find one vendor. But what they're going to find out is what is the two or three best in breed that will partner together and give me what I need. But it's understandable. You don't want to work with three, four vendors. There's dependencies. If one goes down, they all go down. So yeah. they want to mitigate risk. And the, the thought is if we have one, we're going to mitigate risk. But the flip side is no. you actually could increase risk because you're not going to get a great solution and your needs won't be met because one can't do it all. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's funny. The, uh, you know, you mentioned the group world, you know, I know one guy whose favorite quote was, you know, group solutions are like the redheaded stepchild of the, uh, of, of the insurance space. They're always the last consideration, unfortunately, you know, my, my apologies to redheaded stepchildren for the stereotype, but nevertheless, yeah, it really is true. Like they, they are the last solution. They are the last ones to get the innovative solutions. And we, given the and I don't know if it's partially by design, given the processing volumes that have to go through it. I mean, I understand it's a great, yeah. it's technically a greater challenge, but it's also a greater need. Yeah. So it's, I can't, I can't imagine the difficulties you've had in some cases, <laughs> some of these companies, but hey, let's go back to the risk point you made. Yeah, you're right. Like, okay. You think, if you think that going down to one supplier is less risk, well, I mean, yeah, there's one point of contact to go to when something screws up. But when you start looking at the way things are architected today, where you have data se sitting separately in databases from the various apps or, or functions that are, or, or tools that are being overlaid into it, and everything is basically modularized and API and talking to it, you can get yep. best in class experiences yep. cobbled together and just work on those integrations and make that experience great. And if you know what, if something disruptive comes up that's much better at client portals or underwriting or workflow management, whatever it is, you know, then it's a matter, it's not a small lift, but it's a matter of, of plugging that into the existing architecture. So you're only moving one piece of it. And it's funny because again, it's, I feel like the, the wealth management industry came to understand this yep. not that long ago, but it's yep. interesting to hear the insurance industry still having trouble kind of wrapping their heads around that. 
Yeah, totally agree. If I was to call out, you know, in the group, because a big one of the big focuses for us in at Limelight in the U.S. is is understanding the ecosystem, both internally and externally. Yep. And especially in Canada, like those are the two big markets for us. Where what is providing the most value of the systems that need to connect together, right? Internally and externally. You know, in the U.S., the external enrollment platform, Ben Admin, you call it, that's high value, and the adoption's been very slow. We're like in the twenty percent of online enrollment, but that it's like every employee should enroll online. Who should be enrolling on paper? But it's this massive shift and change um, to way that brokers and, and carriers have architected their whole workflows, right? So our like quote to enrollment integration in, in the US, pushing to those Ben Advins to make it easy for a broker not to manually set the group up. But if you look at the value it saves the broker, the value of that is, wow, they get a great, we can put three carriers in one system, yeah. right? One experience. And then the holy grail is that that data flows back to the carrier. That is holy grail efficiency and lift from a group perspective. But that's like ecosystem in the US, which is we're finding a little bit different in Canada, but us mm-hmm. really identifying the high value, where does data need to be internally, externally, and where does it need to flow? And, and there's going to be differences as we're seeing both markets. There is. So, okay, let's talk about what's preventing that holy grail from being basically achieved at this point. So what are you seeing right now that are just the general issues? Is it just the age of some of these backend systems? Like what's going on? So, you know, I'll start with a lot of the experience. If we just talk about the Ben Admin systems, so these external, a lot of them started the same time we started, five, six years, some 10, 15, you know, you've got in the US benefit focus, plan source, you know, some of them have been around for a while. They were more used for up market, right? So you you have this yeah. where with small groups, there's no money on the table to give technology. That's been a problem. So the small group market is the most underserved. Yeah. It's actually the ones that need technology the most actually well, work. That's the irony, right? <laughs> like it's it's the one, it's the one that there's no money on the table except in aggregate. <laughs> But it's also That's the right. one that would needs it the most to actually improve the margins to the point where it, That's right. you know, it has that spend. Yeah. That's right. So what my point is, these pen admins, a lot of the ones that are focused on the small group market in the U.S., like Ease, Essential now Ease or Employee Navigator, they're really big in the U.S., kind of the 100 market, 500 size market. Everyone's built different, right? So it's not some standardization that you're going to build an enrollment platform. And everyone had to start with medical. So when you look at what we see, because we're focused a lot with the non-medical carriers, the dental, vision, life, disability, supplemental health products. So these platforms were built for medical. So if you look at like, that's like the biggest, most important product line, but then you've got where we're selling to a carrier that's non-medical products. Well, the functionality for all those systems is varying and they're catching up with what they did for medical for all the other products. So just that right there says a lot in, if I'm just working with a, a dental vision life disability carrier, they're going to have some gaps and in, in, in to get the data back from those carriers or to even help there be a great online enrollment experience because we put all the eggs focus in medical decision support. And we've got to catch up with the systems for the non-medical products to really give the benefit to those carriers that aren't selling medical. So tell me about the like success stories you've had. And you don't have to name companies and divulge, like violate any kind of confidentiality here. But give me an example of, in your mind, the biggest success you've had in terms of what the end end experience looks like from consumer to broker to backend uh, underwriters, everything. Like what's, what was that file completion said? Yes, this is the closest I've gotten to ideal. So what I would probably, you know, to answer that, I'd probably pick from a few different, a few different use cases. So, so sure. one example would be, and it's part of it's what we've learned, right? Which is now the way that we interact with district with brokers, because we learn a lot when we sold direct to brokers, we realized the problems that exist for them to do their job, mm-hmm. which is they can't just go get all the data and put it on a spreadsheet that carriers don't want to just free the data. They no. don't. No, it's, they been don't. A strat- it's been a strategy, which I totally understand, especially the non-medical uh, where it's not been monetized. So, yes, but here, so, I'm going to go back to my classic saying on this show, which is very simply, basically, friction is not a way to win business or retain it. It's a way to piss off your consumers. And yep. the company that basically enables freedom from friction typically is pays for the losses in spades in terms of gains. Yeah. I mean, so I, I totally agree. At like probably five years ago, I was jump up on a table and flip over tables and with passion. I feel like now as, as we've spent so much time understanding the internal workings of the carriers and, and really where they're at, it's a journey to get there. And we found ourselves yeah. understanding 
the change management of the of eliminating friction starting internally and that's where they need to understand that the journey internal to external or eliminating that friction ultimately the end consumer because there's a lot of friction with the broker that we obviously experience solving their problem but as we look at the carrier and understanding where they need to actually be to truly yeah. solve the friction they got to get their house in order to really solve friction for the broker yeah, and part it of it is that they've yeah, like part of this friction was almost like it was friction that was either engineered or welcomed in the past because yes. they saw it as, okay, we're going to make things hard. We're going to make it hard to leave us because once we got you, it should That's be right. painful to leave, right? And it's, you know, like, yet meanwhile, none of them would ever want that experience for themselves. So yep. it's, I think, I see what you mean in terms of change management. There's got to be almost, a, there's got to be like a changing in the garden. So many of these companies to get away from people who, who basically their management ethos was essentially Let's make this hard. Yeah, no, you're right. It's just, and I would say, to, and I'm in, in confidence with certain stakeholders at carriers, like the strategy, the strategy to make life difficult is not an w- ultimate winning strategy. So being able to shift to making it as easy as possible for your customer, starting with the broker, to sell your products and renew your products should be a focus. And that's a winning strategy. And there's a shift. I feel like some are going there. So to answer your question, what I'd say is we had a number of brokers and we have to find the right digital broker. So what we learned, starting with brokers, is you could have in one brokerage agency, one, the younger, who was all about it. I mean, he'd bring an iPad in and and be sliding dials and say, hey, you want to make a change? You want to change contributions? You want to look at a new plan? Let's do it right now. And so that, you know, seeing that happen in real time and being able to demonstrate and win new business because you were technology focused, right? Yeah. But in the same agency, there was experiences where others, there's no way they were, they were terrified of that. They, they just weren't into technology. You can't get away from a printed out bound proposal that y- you presented a thousand times, right? So that understanding of even in agencies, right, was hard to get adoption. And some would take it and run with it and take it as a, to actually leverage to win new business. Like imagine this, and I, we, we use this with, with brokers, Show right there in front of them, you're trying to win new business and they've been doing paper enrollment for 20 years. Use our platform, run all the quotes, do the dials, and then mark a proposal sold, push it to a Ben Admin enrollment and pull up in real time at the sales meeting an online enrollment experience with the data you just pushed over. That's it. You, like, talk about, you, know, you want to talk about yeah. the, the, the benefits of reducing friction, the ability That's to right. sign once you see it like that, like, That's right. you know, they, the entire, oh yeah, I'm going to buy it. Okay. Let me go away and prepare paperwork for the next three days and I'll be back in a week. And then we'll book a day where I can come in and sit down with each of your employees and make sure they fill this out right the first time. Correct. Like, I don't know. I, I, it's to me, I, I value my time too highly to think that, <laughs> that that's the yeah. solution. Yeah. I mean, so two other, two more examples to your question, but use case, you know, seeing the positive results and effects of our platform and understanding the group market and all that's going on is renewals, right? So in the U.S., large carrier. So then what, what happened in the shift was how can we engage brokers? And we think about a broker portal, right? That's a big conversation. Mm-hmm. Anytime we talk about a carrier giving a portal for brokers to log into and you separate it out from new business versus renewals. And if you think about if a broker has a hundred groups, they're renewing a block with one carrier. We, we had launched a renewal portal for brokers. And the whole goal was let's make it as easy as possible for you to renew. And they get an email and say, hey, from this carrier, here's your 20 groups, click here to view them. And it was right in a portal. You could look at alternate options and you could even get some broker branding in there so that they didn't have to recreate a renewal proposal. And there were, again, certain brokers that were digging the technology, digging the fact that it was saving them time to renew and cross sell other products and make that mm-hmm. easy in a portal. There was value there. Again, it was an adoption time to get everyone on board, but we saw certain digital forward-thinking brokers working with the carrier in that renewal portal that provided value. And that's one example of a carrier giving an experience to broker to remove friction from a renewal perspective. You know, I think back and I, I, cause I get this question a lot when I sit down with various companies about how they should build out tools and the resistance points are always what comes up first, right? It's like, well, you know, are they even going to use it? They push back on these things already. And it's like, you cannot build your experience for the naysayers who want to operate the way they did 20 years ago. These are the yep. same people who basically ridiculed 20 years ago, ridiculed the people that were in front of them who refused to even open a computer. Right. Like, yep. uh, yet they somehow lost that mentality of understanding that you got to keep current with, with information. And as I always say, like, you know what? Screw them. Like not, not screw them in a bad way, but yeah. like just build it. If they don't use it, they'll yep. keep doing what they're going to do. Like why, why bother yep. with them? And they're going to, they're going to basically age out of the industry anyway. It's the newer people, the people are going to adopt this, who are then going to basically, as you said, 
take that efficiency, take that extra time that they created, upsell, cross-sell, expand their marketplace, and suddenly be able to expand their business, leading to more business for you because you enabled them that are the yep. ones you build it for. Not for, you know, you yep. know. You don't build it for the bottom 10% who don't want to change. You build it for the top, for the leading edge, who are representative of the future. Yep. Um, My third answer use case to value from a carrier perspective, internal carrier, because we talk renewal, you know, portal, that's that's internal, external value with broker. The broker having a tool that they can leverage to be a rock star and actually provide value and at point of sale. We've got one national ancillary carrier in the US and, and they did some study and looking at the five to seven day quote turnaround time. Right. The turnaround times for ancillary is days, right? Five and it, and to it's seven days. Oh yeah. So when you start with an email and how quickly, you know, we've got a lot of stuff around census normalization, right? No, who sends a census in the file format that the carrier wants you to? Totally get it, right? So, but the goal is as quickly as possible internally turn around a quote. So small group market, one case study done in Q4, which is the highest volume, you know, quarter of the year for the small groups primarily. You know, getting that turnaround time down to within an hour, some were at 15 minutes. We're not talking a large group with complexities. We're talking a small group and getting it down to minutes in Q4 is a big deal. So quote turnaround time down to 15 minutes, small group was was their stat back to us. The ability to win more business and there was kind of a range of a 10, 5 to 10x. And that was actually taken from a real use case where a broker sales rep were actually at a meeting and employer wants this other product and this other plan design. And it's crunch time Q4, right? So literally go have a coffee. We'll be right back. Run the quote, go back to the meeting. And here are the rates, like literally over a cup of coffee, being able to come back and show that and then win that line of coverage because you didn't have to say, oh, I, it'll take a day. Oh, I'll come back to you. So that was showing increase in selling more business because of that efficiency at point of sale. And the third call out for them that was important was was their new staff training. I mean, some of the systems and booklets and manuals take months. I've heard one that, you know, one month of onboarding per product line. So an underwriter takes a month to learn all the rules and state variations or province variations that you have to look at a manual, right? So a one month to onboard versus a few days where you have a system that actually has state, location, province variations built into the platform. So you don't have to look at a manual. You don't have to look at a manual to tell you what you can and can't do from a plan design, you know, variation. So there's just intelligence built into the process as it should be. That's right. Yes, that's right. It's amazing that it's, you know, I always have this other saying on this podcast, which is the reason fintech exists is because traditional carriers allowed it to exist because if they had just kept their own stuff current, then they wouldn't have competition from new upstarts, but it is what it is, you know, and and further to your point, you know, the, the use case example of go have a coffee and here's the update on this complex thing that would otherwise take seven days. I mean, for, for those agents and advisors who don't want to modernize, this is who you're up against. Like yeah. you're up against people who, whose experience is far superior to what you're doing. I mean, like, you know, even for cases that aren't even that complicated or minor changes, like you can totally envision a situation whereby they quickly do the modification for the client, hit pro, a process, continue a conversation yeah. socially, and then ping, here it is. That's right. Right. And it's That's like right. versus, wait a minute, but I've been dealing with Ed for all these years and Ed you know, it took two weeks to get back to me on this last time. He said like, so the question becomes, is Ed a dinosaur and not using this stuff? Is Ed basically just not respecting my time? Is he not trying to earn my business? Am I being neglected? Right. So it's not just the, don't assume it's because they think you don't, you're not good with computers. They may think it's just simply because you're just not valuing because you're taking so long. Yep. So yep. any other, uh, so this, uh, we finished the cycle here. So you got, you got in the agent experience, the client experience. We talked about the underwriters. What else we got? I'd say actuarial, another use case, actuarial. So when we talk about, I was talking about, you know, more front end user experience, but if you look at the back end, right? So real, real move the needle. When you look at countless stats on internal actuarial and product design at a group carrier, let's say a disability, a you know, long-term disability, you want to change a benefit provision in your internal legacy mainframe monolithic green screen system? Well, you got to get that on the calendar and that could be months and a million dollar of IT work to go do it. And, and, the, and the guy that knows the language retired. So, you know, like that's, those are real stories. Was it COBOL? Sorry. It, keeps it is. It was, that, that, that's, <laughs> So, so that's a reality of the back end configuration for rating where a big focus for us is actuarial rating. So we have a whole proprietary interface for our actuarial customers to live in, to build out their manual rating. 
right? So, and if they want to make changes, you change a benefit design, you need a, you know, potentially a factor associated with that. So they're linked together and um, having actuaries and see their face that lights up where they can visually see and understand their rating. And whereas when you ask a lot of carriers about their rating, they don't, they don't know, they're, yeah. they're, you know, it's in the spreadsheet. So you got to basically reverse engineer and there's not clear visibility and knowledge of rating. No, I'm not discounting. There's some that are way farther along than others, right? So yeah. this is just, if you look broadly across the market, so configuring rating in a scalable system that can handle small groups, simplified rating, you know, mid-sized market, and then large market, like you've got variances that are going to happen there with rating. And a lot of the carriers have separate actuaries, separate rating models that are all in separate systems by segment and product line. Yep. So our whole approach is bring all products together and have variants of rating models that are dynamic and that are scalable as you want to make changes. And I'd say where we're not at yet, but where the market's going is the blend of the external and internal data that carriers are not tapping into for rating. Hmm. If you've got your manual rating, that's, that's great. And you've used it for 20 years, 30 years, five years. But as you look at that value and accessibility of experience data, and you, the U.S. is a big movement to the external risk scoring data. And how can that be leveraged to better underwrite and rate? You need a system that can bring all that data together. So I'm more calling out just putting our actuarial customers on our platform to build manual rating at the core. And they're set up to be able to innovate in the future. But it takes time. So like you can just say, hey, actuaries, rating is going to change. Right. It, it takes time to get there and you have to be on a platform. And that's what we're seeing with our group carrier customers and actuaries that are living in our platform. So let's define that external data we're talking about here. We're talking about like basically looking for anything that other than they're providing you. So are we talking about web scra like data scraping off the internet? We're talking about searching social media. Like what kind of, what, what are you seeing being used as external data right now in, in uh, so, actual work? Yeah. So it'd be available consumer data. You got DMV, you've got credit yep. data, all of that data associated when we think about the data used from a credit scoring perspective, you want to buy a house, you know, all that data, you learn a lot about someone. So all that available data, Rx data, that's a big one, right? And so there's a lot, there's a big movement for like Milliman GRX in the US was yeah. kind of this big player. But now you've got this entrance of a lot of external data sources, some that have, you know, 6,000 elements on 250 million people in the US population. Mm -hmm. And so it's DI, so a lot of it's, it's de-identified, but yeah. they're, they're, the ability and the algorithm to de-identify it and look at a subset of people on the census like this. And it's really helping and driving what's good risk, what's bad risk, right? Not yeah. just, don't just tell me what's bad risk. That's where it started. But now it's, let's identify good risk and go market and target those markets, right? And that's really the strategy of carriers that can leverage that data to- You know, it's interesting. Like people get kind of freaked out by this, even if it is anonymized, this, you know, data mining that's happening in order to find and better identify these risks and always a little bit fearful they're going to get screwed over. But I mean, this sort of thing has existed long before even big data existed. I mean, I think of Geico, for example, who, which yep. stands for Government Employees Insurance Corporation. And they started off specifically because someone noticed that the rates of basically of accident claim or whatever it was that we were insuring at the time were lower amongst government employees than they were amongst the rest of the market and was able to find a niche and basically, you know, run with it and gain scale. And and get into other markets. So, you know, this is this is nothing new. This is just where, you know, our, our, our tools for doing it have gotten significantly better and much larger in scale. So first off, before we get to the final questions, I just want to say before I forget, I, I'm glad guys like you are actually making inroads uh, on fixing these problems because as you heard in the various panel, in the panel discussion we were on previously, I'm not the most optimistic when it comes to insurance companies because they I've heard stuff is going to happen and I've never seen it happen or what I've seen has been pretty lackluster thus far, but I'm glad to hear that the gears are moving and guys like you are greasing the wheels. So basically, before we wrap up, there's three questions I ask everybody. The first one is, if you had one wish for something you could change in your company or in the industry, what would it be? Oh, wow. Well, you know, if I would say one thing that I could change from a limelight company perspective, I, of course, I wish, you know, I mean, I started as our chief product officer. So I, I always wish that our product was two years down the road now, because I'm always like, I wish that we just had all the functionality now. So that's just the tension that we live in as we, as we listen to where the market's going and you have to build thoughtfully and you can't raise. So that's that's a big desire that I have, of course, is that we just had more functionality, right? But we're getting there. So that's exciting. That's just living in the real world. From a market perspective, I think one thing is that I would I would love to see the change in the embrace of best in breed in the ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of resistance, again, not only just the tech platforms that want to do everything, but also carriers that are, there's a lot of fear. People want to 
I get it. People have been there 20, 30 years. You want to retire well. You don't want to go out with the risk of like digital transformation and you go out and you blow your whole, like, so people just don't want to do change because of the potential risk for just your own personal retirement plan, right? I mean, yeah. I've been here 30 years at this carrier and the last thing, right? So I'm hoping that the mission of the group industry that we see ourselves together collectively to really bring about the change and do the hard work. I mean, I, the tiger is a song that's been a company song and an industry song that I actually recorded by the way on iTunes and listen to it. Garrett Vigors, I, the tiger. And we'll put it in the show really notes. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was a call for the group industry to realize, I know it's not easy, but the group industry, that redheaded stepchild that you mentioned, which I was yeah. actually redhead and, and stepchild too, literally. So I, <laughs> I take that in the most positive sense to, to be a part of the solution. So it's really to understand that we can do this. And like to our point, the strategy of, of doing what's best for brokers and distribution from a carrier perspective and what's best for employers and employees is the winning strategy because that's shifting. It's not been the winning strategy and, and the strategy approach, but I hope and believe it's a new decade. You know, so there's a lot, I think, of positivity with the change that I think is, is possible. You know, I find the entire almost asymmetric view of risk to be pretty preposterous. You know, they're concerned about keeping things as they are because they don't want to screw things up before they leave. But how many industries and how many companies have been turned completely upside down in a matter of years that we've seen recently? And, you know, it's not so much, I think, if anything, the concept of modernization should not be something that scares them. It's something that, that basically reinforces that they will retire, especially if they have, you know, old school defined benefit pension plans. You know, you better right, hope that right. that employer is going to be around for a long time. You better want to, you right. might want to modernize them. And I know I was, I was speaking to another fintech consultant the other day and, you know, the subject of Kodak came up and he shared something from someone because he knew someone, he knew that he actually knows the person who actually helped come up with the actual digital camera chip. And, you know, what it came down to was it wasn't that Kodak didn't realize that this was the future and this was going to change everything. It's that they did not want to basically have to make a decision that was going to lead to all of these people eventually being fired down the road. Yeah. But at yep. the end of the day, the lack of making a decision led to all of those people eventually being fired yep. down the road. Yeah. Right? So yep. uh, the change is coming one way or another. The question is, what end of it are you on? So the second yep. question I ask is, what's been the biggest challenge you faced thus far in getting to where you are today with the company? So biggest challenge I'd say that we face today is, you know, what I'd say is the res is resistance to change. At the end of the day, it's kind of a lead in with question one, but it's been resistance to change and really the lack of an ecosystem, right? Because it, it's really hard when you've got the ecosystem is cobalt, you know, internal legacy systems. That's an ecosystem that it's a problem. You can't just put lipstick on a pig. You put lipstick on a pig, right? And on the back end, we're calling some 50 year old system. That's a short term solve, right? So as we think about the resistance to change and adoption of modern platforms in the group ecosystem, that's the story we're telling. And so it's really dependent on an ecosystem that actually exists. And that's slow moving in the group space. We're getting there. But that's, that's been a big, a big challenge that we've faced. And what I'd say is we're newer to the market. There's some that have been around 10 or 15 years. And so some of the challenges we faced is, oh, well, you don't have every feature I want. And it's like, and I flip it on, I flip it upside down and say, you know what? It's grateful. We're not an on-prem solution that built 15 years ago. And for us to hack those systems to get in the cloud, you know, we're fully in the cloud, AWS, full mm -hmm. SaaS solution. So I flip it on its head. So we're building our roadmap of the best team and we're building the functionality not from a 10, 15 years to go, ago perspective, but where the market's at today we're building. And the market's totally in a different place and the features and functionality needed is different than it was five, 10 years ago. So again, some of those challenges were six years in. Some of our competitors on the underwriting rating side, they've been around longer maybe a little bit more functionality, but our speed of roadmap and building modern platform integration focus first is powerful. But it's been a challenge, but it's also become a strength of ours. So it's, you know, the COBOL story always gets amusing. It's, it's like, it's becoming a running joke on this, on this show. I often say that you want your kids to make good money. Don't teach them the program in Python or, or anything else. Teach them how to, how to program in COBOL. Uh, yeah. Because frankly, those, the people who do that are super old and not going to be around much longer. And while yeah. we were talking, I actually just said, hey, just how old is COBOL as a programming language? And I looked this up and sure enough, the groundwork it was in the 50s when Grace Hopper basically built Flowmatic. And for those who don't know Grace Hopper, she's one of the most influential programmers of all history. And COBOL 60 was released on the 28th of May, 1959. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I have the other running joke I have is that in the life insurance industry, I know what you're doing. You're just waiting for these people to die. So you're not worried about migrating from systems. So that's a solution. However, if you're still using that as a backend solution in the group space, that's not an option. And that's pretty frightening. <laughs> so yeah, kid, teach your kids COBOL because it'll pay off at least for the next 20 years. <laughs> that's right. Job security for sure. Yeah. That is, that is super job security and your peers, you know, it'll be, it'll be a 20 year something year old COBOL programmer and guys in their seventies are just like, let me retire already. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So last question I ask is what inspires you and gets you up every morning to keep doing what it is you're doing and gives you the energy to keep fighting the good fight, especially in this space. Yeah. I hearken back to the days when I was a broker and I would sit with employers who would basically share about their company's vision and, and how the, certain things they wanted to do, but the cost of insurance, right? So it's hearing those real life stories from employers and that, you know, treat their employees like family, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, talk about certain employees that have these certain needs. And I, so I'd listen to that, got me extremely getting back to the why I exist. I get up every day and then sitting with those employees and hearing stories of, hey, my kid needs to be on this medication and which plan do I go with? And what do you think? Listening to those stories literally has driven us from day one to recognize the value that the one decision that that broker and employer make, that's literally going to affect 50 families, 100 families, 500 families, whatever that employer offers their benefits to. So that's been a big part of the why. So I, I get up every morning thinking there's a big journey to get to that broker and that employer and that employee. And our job is to stay true to that why and enable carriers to actually help that journey be as efficient as get rid of the friction and actually make it a beautiful, magical experience. Mm-hmm. So that that's really where I was definitely, I'd say, started the passion. I mean, back again, playing music, I thought, do I want to be in insurance for the rest of my life? But I've, you know, it's become a massive passion for me. And it's it's true value uh, that Absolutely. you know benefits are a big deal. And employers are the gateway to, you know, in the US, 50%, 51% of the population gets their insurance through an employer. And I would say the passion of small group employers is really where we double down because they're the most underserved and they're the ones in the most need. They don't have a staff of four people working on their benefits. It's yep. literally the owner who puts and the most benefit cons- hat on. sensitive, That's right. you know, uh, everything. And, you know, I was about to see, you kind of stole my last comment there, which was, you know, especially given the importance of the group space in the American market. Uh, I mean, you yeah. know, without whatever's happened to the Affordable Care Act and the defunding, whatever it is, but without the government option that so many of us outside the U.S. count on every day as the base foundation of our, of our health care, there is no, you know, the employers play such a central role to the protection of their employees in the U.S. It is, it's almost, it's overly burdensome in my opinion, yeah. but vitally important. Yep. So Garrett, thank you very much for taking the time. And again, like I said, keep keep fighting the good fight because uh, I'm glad to hear this is all happening in the background and one day I'll see it in the foreground, <laughs> but, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, I mean, you know, when the fight, our, our latest kind of marketing is win the fight with Limelight. We have a whole boxing ring and we were at InsureTech Connect, literally had six punching bags with boxing gloves to literally punch a punching bag that said silo systems and legacy systems. One was Word Doc proposals, one was spreadsheets, one was multi-entry. It was literally a whole visualization, people punching the villains. The things I right? hate. That, Fantastic. That's exactly right. And, <laughs> and, and understanding, you know, that's where we're at in the group space. And so, yeah, win the fight with Limelight has been a big focus for us in the boxing ring. And it's exciting to be in the ring. And we're really excited. 2020 is going to be a great year and a great, great decade. So uh, thanks for letting me be a part of your show. My pleasure. I'll take care. All right. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Garrett Vickers, and hopefully we will see a lot of what Garrett's talking about happen in Canada and elsewhere around the world to take the pain out of a uh, less than user-friendly process to date. And with that, as always, I'm Jason Pereira. If you enjoyed this podcast, please review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.